In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Sons and daughters of the resurrection. I think it was one of those high school aha moments in my life. I don't know if I was just getting more introspective or just a little bit more aware of my position in the world and what was going on, but I remember saying to one of my friends once, you know, we're all just a, little, a bunch of little black dots on this earth. From my vantage point, looking down from up high, what were we but just so many little black dots scurrying over the face of the earth like so many ants? And there was one for me, entirely indistinguishable from all of the other ones. Now, I wasn't trying to be depressing or anything. Like I said, it's just kind of that realization that this is a pretty big world and what's my place in it? How do I belong? And as a teenager, those are usually pretty powerful thoughts as you're trying to figure out your place in the world and, and how you relate to your fellow high schoolers and teenagers. And maybe, maybe those thoughts never always quite leave us. Maybe, maybe we never quite get that settled in our life because it seems to me that we, we do spend a lot of time trying to figure out how our lives can be meaningful, how they can be worthwhile. Somebody might, might find their significance in their career or in their family relationships or in the relationships with other people. Others might, might look for significance in, in sin, like uh, the the abuse of God's gift of sex, or they might, they might find significance in, in the pleasures of life and entertainment. It just seems that we're often trying to answer that question, my life is worthwhile because of blank. And then we get a section of scripture from Revelation chapter 5, a scene like this. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. It's a pretty amazing scene. John, the Apostle John, had been given this look into heaven. And he saw this throne there, beautiful throne. God the Father seated on that throne. Around him were four living creatures who represented all the different forms of life on this earth. There were 24 thrones around that throne. Each one had an elder sitting on that throne. And of course, 24 is 12 times 2. And so you think of the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 apostles. So here we have the whole church praising God. And along with those creatures, they sang the praises of God the Father. When all of the sudden, a lamb who looks as if he had been slain arrives in heaven. And heaven erupts in this praise and this joyous singing at the arrival of this lamb because what we are seeing here is the ascension of Jesus. Normally, we think of the ascension from the point of view of the disciples. Remember standing out there and Jesus rises up and and the angels appear and tell them that he's going to come back the same way they had seen him go. That's usually how we view ascension. But here, here is ascension from the viewpoint of heaven. As the Lamb of God, the, the one who is slain for the sins of this world, appears this chorus of angels, sings their song of praise. A, a chorus, by the way, that's huge. Almost an incomprehensible number. Could you imagine 200 Miller Parks, each filled to capacity, that gives you an idea of just how many there were, and it's even more than that. And this, this angelic choir, they sing with all their might a song, and it starts out, 
Worthy is the lamb who was slain. And that idea of worthiness in Greek culture came from a, a picture of a scale or a balance. You'd weigh and measure two things. And if the, the balance measured correctly, then something would be considered worthy. So you're always comparing something when you think of worthiness. And, and so here on the one side of the scale is the lamb who was slain and his work. And on the other side of the scale is what God the Father had sent this lamb to come and do. Did they balance out? Yes, they did. And so he is worthy to receive power and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise and wealth. All of it. Because he earned it. He did everything. So if Jesus was going to point to something in his life that justified his existence something in his life that proved that he was worthy, what would he point to? He'd point to himself, right? He'd point to his work. That's worth. That's worthiness. That's wealth and strength and power and all of that. Now, what could you or I ever do to measure up to that level of worthiness? I mean, you know how hard you work for the things in your life. You know what you've done. What do you have to show for it? And it's not that it's all bad, but think it through, right? There's still struggles. There's still hardships. Plans fail. There's challenges to overcome, health issues, whatever. What do we have to show for all of our effort in this world? We tell a, a young person to go out, make your mark in this world. And then the young person goes and they, they do that. And they find that, that their mark on this world is so infinitely small why did I just put in all of that work? And it looks an awful, like, an awful lot like we are just a bunch of black dots scurrying around on the face of this earth. And that can lead a person, that kind of human way of thinking, can lead kind of two different directions. You can, you can go down the path of nihilism, and, and everything's nothing, right? Nothing matters. Who cares? Do whatever the blank you want to do. Because at the end, you just die and nothing matters, right? Or the other extreme would be narcissism in which, which life just becomes all about making yourself as grand a person as you can manage and, and, and becoming bigger than, than important and, and all of that. And the in-between of those two extremes isn't much better. <coughs> And did you notice, though, did you notice that, that either way it leads to the same goal in the end? It leads to us. So let me ask you a very important question. When you get to heaven, do you expect to receive the same kind of ovation that Jesus did? Do you expect heaven to erupt in praise at your arrival because of what you have done? Now, regardless of how you answer that question, you have to confront the reality that it's not going to happen that way. There is nothing you or I could ever do to match up to the worthiness of Christ, to match up to, to his ability to achieve such great and superior things. And so all of this talk of of you got to look within yourself and you've got to name it and claim it for yourself and you've got to find that inner strength and believe in yourself and all of that, it is all bunk because none of us have the power to do that. None of us have the power to overcome every obstacle, to achieve every goal, to control and manipulate everything so that it goes the way that we want it to. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I am not saying... Don't bother with setting goals in your life. Please do. Please go and achieve wonderful things and great things. But what is your motivation? If the motivation is to, to prove your worth to God or to yourself or to a relative, a spouse, or a parent, or some other person, if that's the motivation, then you are working on a fool's errand. Because all that ever leads to is an obsession with self. 
And then I got to wonder, what kind of a relationship with God can you have if you're so busy staring at your face in the mirror? You know what really surprises me about this section from God's Word? The the part that just kind of caught my eye? It's that John is there. He's there. I mean, you've got to try to realize what big things are going on here. Here is John, a sinful man, who has been permitted to step into the glory of heaven and view the things which no man should see, which, which human language can barely comprehend of. And Jesus allows him to see all that. Jesus invites him to see all of that. He wants him to write this down because Jesus wants to share it. He wants to share it with John. He wants to share his victory with sinners. And so John gets to see the Lamb go to that throne and there on that throne claim his victory, his victory. Victory, which meant he quite literally went through hell for mankind. That that victory, which meant he stomped the devil's power and destroyed him forever. That victory, which brought him through the narrow chambers of death. And he came out the other side, not only victorious, but worthy of everything. All power, all glory, all wisdom, all strength, all wealth, all glory and praise. All of it. He won it all. No, he earned it all. Earned it by his precious and innocent blood. Every bit of that he deserved. So uh, this guy in West Dallas who, who won the lottery, right, the Powerball guy, by the way, that's two sermons in a row I'm using that illustration, so I don't know if I'm thinking about this too much or what. But here's this guy, right? He wins all this money. And what would it be like if he called you up and told you that he was going to share that with you? Aside from probably not believing him, right? I think we'd all be pretty impressed with this. And so what do we have here? But our, our Savior himself, who has ascended to his throne because of the work that he has done. And what does he do? He reaches out his hand and he says, come here. Come and share your master's happiness. I mean, is it any wonder why Peter would jump off the edge of the boat and swim 100 yards to see his savior? Is it any wonder why then a man who wanted to murder Christians would turn into creating Christians? This is the power of that victory. And Jesus made sure that John was there, a sinful man like John, so that he could write it down, so he could share that victory with as many unworthy people as he could find, like you and me. So that you and I would never, ever have to wonder if my unworthiness, if my self-absorption and foolishness would ever end God's love. We would never have to worry about that. That's the power of Christ's victory. The victory that he's made you a part of. So it is worth it to follow Christ. It is worth it to be a part of his kingdom. It is worth it to follow him wherever he leads. It's worth it to to look at your life and and see where God has placed you and, and in whatever role it is to do the very best you can. And so whether you are a hospital worker or a hospital patient, whether you are a student or a teacher, whether you are a commuter or a retired person, whatever role you are in your life, God gets to use you and through you share his love with this world so that more people can learn of this victory that you are a part of. I mean, look at the victory. Look at the celebration. Look at the lamb who was slain. And then look at your life. And look at what Jesus has made you a part of. Worth it, right? Amen. Amen.